really started making infinite robots. What is the definition of life? For a long time, people have believed that we have figured out all of the ways of life that can exist on this planet. Plants, fungi, multicellular animals, archaea, bacteria, and protists exist. However, this creature does not fit into any of these categories. The existence of this object has sparked one of the greatest debates in modern science. Under a microscope, these organisms propel themselves forward, backwards, and sometimes spin in circles. If you scatter some particles around them, they will gather and form small piles to organize the debris. Their motion and behavior even resemble that of other microscopic organisms. They are motile, heal damage, retain information, and even work together. However, these organisms were not born out of millions of years of evolution. They were instead designed by computers and built by human hands. Xenobots are synthetic life forms or living robots and consist of two things, skin cells and the heart cells of the frog Xenopus lavis, after which they are named. They are the first man-made organism and an entirely new type of living system. Scientists hope that they will help us monitor radioactivity combat pollution, or even cure disease. When they were first created, Xenobots were already testing the boundaries of how we define life. But then something truly startling happened. They started to spontaneously reproduce, making new copies of themselves in a way that science has never observed before. How is it possible for scientists to create a new type of life form? How will these tiny creatures one day be of great use to us? And what can they tell us about the nature of life itself? Biobot history. Biorobotics, also known as soft robotics, is a relatively new one. Like traditional robotics, it aims to solve human problems by building machines. However, instead of steel, nuts, and bolts, the primary raw material used in biorobotics is living tissue. It is a discipline that combines biology and mechanical design. Biohybrid robots are typically made of cardiac or skeletal muscle tissue and an artificial scaffold. And the benefit of using biology in robotics is substantial. Biological components have distinct properties that artificial materials cannot duplicate exactly. Their greater flexibility enables them to move more like living organisms than machines. They tend to respond to external stimuli quickly and naturally. Some may even be able to recover from damage or injuries. Although artificial structures are susceptible to entropy, the gradual decline into disorder, the crumbling of concrete, the rusting of metals, and the breakdown of plastics, living organisms are constantly fighting entropy. They preserve their internal order by taking energy from their surroundings. This quality alone could allow biobots to far surpass the useful lifetimes of our even best artificial technologies. One of the earliest examples of soft robotics is this creation made in 2014. It's composed of a plastic backbone surrounded by heart muscle tissue from a mouse. By pulsing current in the liquid media at different frequencies, the muscle cells are told to contract, and the biohybrid is made to walk, albeit in a very jerky way. A year later, this idea was refined and used sea slug muscles. This biohybrid was designed after a sea turtle, so it can move more easily through its aquatic environment. Other biorobotics focus on articulation, a robot that has arms or legs that can be used to manipulate its environment. This biohybrid is an articulated limb with muscle tissue attached to an artificial backbone. By changing the voltage on the left or right side, the muscles compress or contract, causing this articulation that can be used to pick things up or move things around. This biohybrid was inspired by a jellyfish. It uses an artificial scaffold with layered heart tissue. The biohybrid moves in a very similar way to a real jellyfish. Scientists have created a light-controlled stingray. It's a stingray shape made out of an artificial backbone that is layered with rat heart muscles. Instead of being directly activated by electricity, these muscle cells have been programmed to be activated by light. This way, you can drive the robot around by shining lights on either the right or left-hand side. But for all of these mechanics to work, outside input is needed for them to know how to behave. The electricity or light is supplied by a human. Plus, the artificial components can break, and if used in the environment, are not biodegradable, and in the body, not biocompatible. The biological components are being used just as an actuator. They are just providing the machines with motion, as a motor would. 
but cells can do so much more than just contract. There's an entire world of innate behaviour and rich biochemistry that could be utilised in cellular machines. The form of these biorobots all resembles existing organisms, but what useful shapes and forms might exist out there that we can't even imagine? We model machines based on creatures we see around us because it would be impossible to predict the behaviour of some random configuration. Building the Xenobots Xenobots were born out of a goal to make an entirely biological robot with no artificial components. A robot built from the ground up, using only animal cells taking shape not based on any existing life form, but in a novel configuration. And it all starts with a frog embryo. After a frog egg is fertilised, it forms into a ball of stem cells. This clump of cells looks completely uniform, but in reality, all of these cells have a predetermined purpose of what they're meant to become. The cells on top generally become the epidermis, or part of the central nervous system. The cells in the middle form the muscles in the cells on the bottom, which form the endoderm, which leads to the development of organs. These different sections can be disassembled into their different components, and then reassembled into a new arrangement. This D and reconstruction are done entirely by hand using forceps. The desired sections of the embryo are removed, then basically mushed back together. They are then bathed in a media that causes them to stick together, and they re-adhere into a sphere. Then the spheres can be sculpted into new shapes using a cutter riser. The formation of the bots is done by human hands, but the design isn't human at all. It comes instead from a complex artificial intelligence. A program called VoxCAD creates a virtual environment complete with real-life simulations of physics, like gravity, friction, liquid physics, and surface tension. In this environment are small cubes called voxels that represent the cells of Digital's Xenobot. Different cubes represent different real-life cell identities. In the beginning, the researchers started with just two cell types, passive-like skin cells and contractile-like cardiac cells, and they start with one objective for the Digital Xenobot to move forward. The different cell cubes are then combined randomly by the AI, and then placed into an evolutionary algorithm which can evolve the digital Xenobot over time, creating iteration after iteration until it displays the desired behaviour. At first, the algorithm makes completely random designs. These digital bots don't exhibit any interesting behaviours beyond just sort of wiggling a bit. But after many thousands of generations, eventually, the algorithm will produce a digital Xenobot with the desired behaviour moving forward. The final design of the first digital Xenobot was a little blob with leg-like appendages that it could use to scuttle in a walking-like motion. The scientists then make the Xenobot in the lab with the same configuration, sticking the correct cells together and sculpting it into the right shape. And sure enough, when placed in their aquatic petri dish, the bot started walking, and when faced in an orientation facing to the right, they generally always walked to the right. As hoped, the AI quite accurately predicted the way that the bots would move, the pink lines show the movement that the AI predicted, and the blue lines show the actual movement of the Xenobots. The next step was to put the Xenobots to the test, to see if they could move through varied environments, in mazes ranging from wide open fields to tubes as small as half a nanometer in diameter, smaller than the diameter of a human capillary. In all cases, the Xenobots followed the path provided by the environment. Traditional robots would have a lot of trouble navigating something this small, but the Xenobots could do it with ease. Soon, different types of locomotion were created in the bots, including bots with small cilia that beat giving forward motion. These like to spin in circles. The scientists also noticed that if they injured the Xenobots, after about 10 minutes, the wound would close and the bots would heal up. Researchers are still working to understand the intricacies of this, but it appears that self-healing is a built-in feature of these biobots where the contraction at the wound site can help close the injuries. Propelling themselves along and healing the Xenobots, we are already making waves in the scientific community as a revolutionary biohybrid. Emergent behaviour Without being programmed and without any sense of communication organs, the Xenobots spontaneously started to work together, collecting and organising piles of debris. How is such cooperation possible by mindless little bots? A hint comes from a study done in 1999. These are sensorless robots, each with a little scoop on its front, designed simply to drive around. And in their environment, 
are many small disks. The robots don't know about any other robots, can't sense if they're touching anything, and can't tell if they're touching a disk. But as it randomly drives around by chance, it will eventually start pushing a disk. The robot can push one disk or maybe two, but if it comes across a pile of disks, the robot isn't strong enough to keep pushing, so it's forced to reposition itself and let go inadvertently, adding its disk to the pile. Therefore, over time, piles of the disks spontaneously emerge. This is precisely what's happening with the Xenobots. They simply push particles by chance until they cannot, which spontaneously leads to organized piles of debris. And even though it's a mindless and uncoordinated act, it could be a powerful tool for us one day. Scientists think this gathering behavior could allow such bots to collect microplastics from ocean water or to clear plaques from arteries in the human body. This ability led scientists to think about what else the Xenobots could aggregate. What else could they round up and make little piles out of? This is where the Xenobot story gets properly freaky. First, the scientists had the AI redesign these Xenobots to optimize for collecting particles. The original sphere shape isn't ideal for the collection task. Instead, the computer suggested a C shape, which is highly efficient at collecting loose particles and is similar to Pac-Man. The researchers added a compelling material to the Xenobot's environment. Frog stem cells, the raw material of a Xenobot. As the scientists hoped, the Xenobots dutifully swept them up into small piles, just like they did with random debris. Something remarkable happened. The piles of cells turned into new Xenobots. There are many types of reproduction in the world of organisms, from sexual to asexual, from splitting to budding to birth. These processes all share one common trait. They all come from the parent organism in one way or another. However, what Xenobots did has never before been observed in living organisms. It's called kinematic self-replication and has only ever been observed in certain molecules. It's the act of reproducing by moving and compressing dissociated parts in the environment. This ability in robotics could lead to exponential utility over time. Currently, individual Xenobots can live for 10 days in an aqueous environment without needing any outside food source. This is a good start, but limits what Xenobots could do in the real world. But if Xenobots' raw material could be continually added to the environment, it could mean limitless generations of Xenobots. One day, they could perhaps be programmed to selectively pick up and move specific cell types that we want to use in regenerative medicine, aggregating the materials for a body to regrow damaged tissues. Researchers are now working to create Xenobots that have a working memory and a read-write ability to record one bit of information using a fluorescent marker that indicates if they've experienced something in their environment. This type of memory could help us detect the presence of things like radioactive contamination, chemical pollutants, drugs, or certain diseases. By understanding the Xenobots, we start to understand the plasticity of living cells, freed of their evolutionary fate. Cells could be capable of astounding things. They can walk, they can swim, they can collect debris and reproduce. The question is, what else might they be able to do? As for whether or not these bots are alive is still a matter of great debate. They are made out of living cells and can reproduce, but are still very much machines. Our minds like to try to categorize, but in reality, we might need to accept that Xenobots occupy a space between both living and machine. For now, Xenobots are simple black and white nervous systems, but if future biotics are capable of emotions, feelings, or pain, this quandary may need more serious consideration. Harnessing the power of biology will be the driving force behind the next century of technological developments. Whether it's understanding the raw ability of cells whether it's understanding the raw ability of cells free of their evolutionary fate, or analyzing the products of 3.8 billion years of evolution, the natural world has the answers we need. What's your take on this? Do you think we should be playing God with these biobots? What would you want to make out of your own? Let me know down in the comments below and check out one of these other videos. This has been Mr. Singularity, and I'll see you on the next one.